Hi, this is Piero San Giorgio, author of Survive the Economic Collapse. I am here today in Cambridge, Massachusetts at the MIT to interview Mr. Noam Chomsky. Large parts of Boston are pretty kind of like Holland. You know, they're filled land, and uh, in fact, they're now bringing in Dutch specialists to try to help them develop plans to save Boston from rising sea levels. Country. And one of the proposals, the main proposal, is that they replace a lot of the streets with canals. So it'll look like Venice. Yeah. Except look what's happening to Venice. It's, got, it's, also, <laughs> yeah. it's also going down. And, um, and and when I contacted you, is what first of all it was the opportunity as I was coming here to Boston, and my father was working for digital equipment, so I know MIT in Boston for since I was a kid, right? My first computer. Yeah, it was what PDP. Uh, yeah. well, it's great. And um, first of all, I wanted to thank you because your books, especially Manufacturing Consent, since that one, and I've read all of them since then, have been fundamental for me to understand that we were in a world that was not the way it looked and that we have been, we are the media lies to us and you, know, you have described the mechanics in a fantastic way so first of all I wanted to thank you because um, you are um, you com you, you're part of those who changed my life so it's, I'm sure you hear that a lot and, uh, and I wanted to, to, to take this opportunity to ask you a few questions for my... I have, a, of course, some blog for my readers. And um, since manufacturing content, you have analyzed how the media is, seems to be saying more and more the same story. Russia and Putin is evil. Uh, the Arabs and the Muslims are bad. Uh, we seem to have more and more all the media who say the same thing. And I was wondering, what is your, your analysis on today's world events that the media seems to, to be um, uh, uh, an ally of the empire, of the imperial Western control of the world? What's your thoughts on today's media? Well, first of all, I would question that there is more and more because it's always been true. In fact, uh, the, it's a, sort of a mixed story. I mean, it's true that there are fewer voices, so the media have been concentrating. And if you take a look at, uh, yeah, of course, uh, the, uh, the Ben Bagdikian, who's one of the most serious uh, media analysts. He was formerly head of the, uh, the Berkeley uh, School of Journalism, very good scholar. He, has a book called The Media Monopoly, which was the first edition, must have been around 1980. And there are successive editions coming every year. In each edition, the monopoly gets narrower and narrower. By now, it's uh, half a dozen, in the United States, about half a dozen voices. It used to be far more. On the other hand, those voices uh, are not uh, more committed to uh, imperial power than they had been in the past. There are illusions about the golden age, but if you look, say, at the New York Times, the major U.S. journal, uh, uh, far back as you want to go, 100 years ago, it was worse. Uh, so, for example, uh, take, say, Iran, now a major issue. Uh, take a look at the reporting when the U.S. overthrew the government of Iran in 1954. Uh, they just applauded it. Uh, they, uh, the, the, the exact, you should read the exact words, but the editorial said something like this. Uh, the uh, reinstallation of the Shah will be an object lesson to small countries that go berserk with fanatical nationalism and try to take control of their own resources. And they'll have, this will show them that they have to understand that uh, they have to accommodate themselves to the world system that we run. They couldn't run an editorial like that now. It's grotesque. Uh, that was 1953. Mm -hmm. In 1954, when the U.S. Uh, overthrew the democratic government of Guatemala, same thing, euphoric, uh, when uh, 1965, when uh, a 
Suharto uh, took over in Indonesia and carried out a huge slaughter. I mean, a very significant event in world affairs, sort of vindicated the war in Vietnam. That encouraged them to do it. Uh, the Times covered it accurately. They called it a staggering bloodbath, you know, hundreds of thousands murdered. But they were completely euphoric. So it's a wonderful thing. Their uh, main liberal columnist, James Reston, he was the kind of liberal spokesman. He had a column, uh, uh, what's it called, The Gleam of Light in Asia. This was a wonderful thing. Here we were hearing all this bad news, but finally this gleam of light, a mass slaughter of hundreds of thousands of uh, mostly landless peasants, uh, which opens the country to U.S. exploitation. That was 1965, and uh, you go back to 1916 uh, when uh, Wilson invaded Haiti, the same thing, you know, just eupho uh, uh, euphoria. But if anything, it's become more diverse. And I think it has, and it's an effect of the uh, uh, activism of the 1960s, which is, of course, bitterly condemned. It's called the time of troubles and so on. But in fact, it, it kind of civilized the country in many ways. Feminism is one example. Uh, but um, young, many young people were just changed by those years and that experience. And these are the people who worked themselves into uh, say, reporters, editors, and so on, and it somewhat opened and changed the character of the media, not a lot, but uh, the New York Times, for example, is more diverse and, I, th I would say, honest, at least describing what happens with less bias than it did in the past, which is not to say much. So, for example, if you read the uh, news report on the uh, Israeli attack on Gaza. They're literally described as Hamas's assault on Israel. You know, that's uh, Putin, is, uh, as you said, you know, the ultimate evil. And it's not, it's not just the United States. So uh, in England, for example, one of the most respected uh, uh, commentators, uh, scholars on European affairs, Timothy Mark, uh, uh, Timothy Ash, Timothy Garden Ash, a quite respected liberal commentator, he simply uh, describes Putin as uh, that rat-faced, irritable little man, you know, the, and then talks about his horrible actions and so on. I mean, the idea that there might be some rationale to what Russia is doing when the United States moves right into the heartland of their geostrategic concerns, you can barely find. Interestingly, you can find it in other places. So Foreign Affairs, which is the major establishment journal, you know, Council on Foreign Relations, uh, their lead article in the uh, current issue is uh, by an international relations scholar, John Mearsheimer, is uh, the, the title is something like, uh, the West is responsible for the Iran, Ukraine crisis. And then he goes into the uh, analysis of why this is a, such an immense, th what the West is doing, such an immense threat to Russian interests that uh, no matter who is in charge in Russia, they react to it. And he blames the West for the crisis, but you don't read that in the media. Google almost never. Uh, but so, so, so basically, I agree with your picture, but it's, uh, there has been a narrowing of voices. There are fewer, many fewer media. And uh, those that remain are, have, have been reduced in quality enormously. So take the Boston Globe right here. This is a major city, you know, academic center, intellectual center. This is the lead newspaper. It used to be quite a good newspaper. Uh, now, take a look at it. Uh, some, they'll pick up a couple of columns from the New York Times or Associated Press that do no reporting. It's basically on local affairs. And the same has happened throughout the country. San Francisco, when you were there, if you read the San Francisco Chronicle, it also used to be a serious newspaper. Yeah. Now it's, uh, you find out about the, you know, some corruption in the mayor's office or something like that. Uh, and, and that's changed a lot. Uh, on 
the other hand, the individual media, I think, to some extent, reflect the uh, uh, impact of the activism in the 60s and subsequent years in uh, broadening understanding, concerns, uh, changing just the moral, <coughs> moral character of the country, which does influence them to an extent, limited, however. If you look closely, it's basically a hewing to the state corporate line. Very little critique of it. Some, but not a lot. Mm -hmm. How do you see the internet media <clears throat> playing? I heard you say that it's a double-edged um, kind of media where you can find very relevant information, but you can also find incredible idiots. No, and it, it is double-edged. I mean, it's. I mean, I use it all the time. You know, wouldn't be without it, but. Uh, so it's a lot easier, to, and you can get access to all kinds of things that took a lot of work in the past, or you couldn't get it all. You can get immediate access to them. All that's to the good. And it does uh, mean that if you want, you can read uh, the British press, or the French press, you can read Le Monde Diplomatique, uh, you, can, uh, you can read uh, Latin American reporting if, if, you, if you put out the effort. And a, wide, and a wide range of, of opinion on, on blogs, much of which is interesting. All of that's very positive. Uh, on the other hand, uh, it does have a negative effect. Uh, it, it, uh, however, even the best of the blog material is not direct reporting, for the most part. When you lose the direct reporting, uh, even if it's uh, biased, you're losing a lot. There are very good reporters, serious ones. Uh, maybe what they report gets modified and changed as it works its way through the editorial uh, you know, that filter, but uh, they're good people and they work hard and they discover things. You can't do that when you're a blogger. You're not on the scene. So the, and as the internet has expanded, the reporting of the journals themselves has declined. So take, say, the Boston Globe again. In the 1980s, it had bureaus all over the world, very good reporters. A lot of them were personal friends. It had some of the best reporting on Central America during Reagan's wars there. Uh, now, they're all gone. Uh, you, can, uh, you, know, you can read people's opinions about it, but you, can get, you, can, you can't read it in the morning newspaper. Uh, the other, another negative effect of the internet, I think, is that uh, this incidentally has been studied. It, it tends to uh, draw people to the to their own beliefs and attitudes. I mean, I don't say that critically. I do the same thing myself. One of the blogs I look at are the ones I think I'm probably going to agree with. Uh, but that's not a good thing. Uh, it's a good idea to read widely. In fact, in journals, I make a point of it. I read the right-wing journals, conservative journals, so, you know, and you learn a lot from them. But if you're just kind of focused on the people you already agree with, while you may learn something to reinforce your own beliefs, you're going to miss a lot, too. And, and that's happening very strikingly. So the people who, uh, to whom Fox News appeals, let's say, are not going to hear another voice. Uh, mm. it's, uh, and that's that's dangerous. Um, I felt <clears throat> also. I think it's I think it's, it's maybe hard to prove this, but I think it's kind of undercutting the the habit of reading. I can see it with students; they just don't read as much because it's easier to look something up on the internet. And there's a difference. It's a big difference between reading a book, thinking about it, or going back the preceding chapter. That's serious reading. But when it comes through rapidly on the, on the screen, it just doesn't penetrate the same way. And I think it leads to a certain superficiality. It's, it's having a, that kind of effect, I think, especially with the younger people on uh, just superficiality of relationships. I mean, there are people who think they have a hundred friends because when they put something on Facebook saying, I'm having an exam tomorrow, they'll get 
a 20 letter saying, hey, I hope you do well. Or something. But that's not the trend. <laughs> You, you think that's also the reason why there are so many um, ha people who are hardcore believers into extremely many, and some may be true, so many conspiracy theories? The conspiracy theories are quite interesting. I mean, in places like the Middle East, they're rampant. Everything is a conspiracy theory. And there are beliefs in the awesome power of the United States or the Jews or someone or other. And you can understand why. When you have, uh, when everything looks hopeless and your society's falling apart and you don't have any constructive thing to do and you see all this chaos and uh, uh, unintelligible horrors going on, you will try to make up some picture of what's happening. And uh, without serious resources and serious discussion of serious political groups where people can interact and interchange and work out their ideas and so on. Without that whole array of options, people will turn to uh, inventing some story. And it's happening in the West, too. It's, uh, and these things spread like wildfire through the Internet. I mean, somebody, you, you suppose that you and I tomorrow, right now, we decide to start a conspiracy theory here. We decide to say, uh, Obama is poisoning the water supply throughout the Western world because he wants to kill off the lower classes. Uh, tomorrow, somebody will have a post say, yeah, I saw a strange man in my backyard uh, digging a hole. And I asked him what he was up to, and he went away. You know, and, uh, Then somebody else will have some other story. Pretty soon you'll have, a, you'll have a, a, a group of people interacting, reinforcing one another, uh, establishing this uh, theory as a firm belief. And if anyone doesn't believe it, they're a, a CIA um, spy or a left gatekeeper or some other story. Now that happens over and over. And it draws an enormous amount of effort and energy away from serious activism. Uh, I, th I mean, if I were to construct a conspiracy theory, I'll, I don't believe it, but let me say, I would say the government is running these things because it's very beneficial to power. It draws, it draws energy away from authentic critique of power. So if they were smart, they'd be seeding these things, like the 9-11 conspiracies. The government, if they were smart enough, they'd be stimulating. They they're, not, they they're not that smart. Well, no, maybe not. It just <laughs> happens on its own. We had the exact same discussion. I'm sure you know uh, William Bloom down in uh, Washington, D.C. I interviewed him on this topic. And he also agreed that we are focusing people, whether it's, but well, for sure it's happening, away from um, the real problems, which is the, the, the poverty, the, the disenfranchisement, disenfranchisement, Franchisation of people away from uh, the production means in the cities, um, the purchasing power is dropping, the food quality for the lower classes is dropping, health is dropping for the lower classes. Well, look, mean, mean income and now is probably lower in 1989, 25 years ago. And uh, as for disenfranchisement, uh, take a look at the academic political science literature. It's extremely interesting. They, it's one of the main topics they study is the relation between attitudes and policy. It's a pretty straightforward topic, policy. You see uh, attitudes you can discover from pretty sophisticated and extensive polling, very heavily polled society. And the conclusions are pretty striking. Um, roughly 70% of the population, lower 70% on the income scale, is literally disenfranchised. Uh, their representatives and the government just pays absolutely no attention to their opinions. As you move up the scale, you get a little more influence, but not much. When you get to the very top, you know, top tenth of a percent, they're basically setting policy. Well, people may not read the literature, but they're aware of it. Uh, and it even shows up in polls. They're aware that uh, the, the government pays absolutely no attention to them. Their opinions don't matter. So why bother voting? Uh, and uh, if uh, if all of this is happening to me, then there's got to be some hidden power behind it that's controlling it, not uh, 
the, the financial institutions and the uh, which you know, just huge factor in the economy and like a like a vulture eating away at the authentic economy, but uh, and mostly subsidized by the public. Mm. I mean, there's actually you probably saw an IMF study that came out uh, about a year ago on the profits of the six major American banks, where they concluded that they basically make no profits. Uh, all their profits virtually can be traced to the government insurance policy, uh, which gives them cheap credit rating, uh, cheap credit, uh, uh, higher inflated credit <coughs> ratings, and the opportunity to make a risky, profitable investments because it's going to be bailed out by the public anyway. And uh, uh, the, the business press estimated that from their figures, the annual public subsidy at about $83 billion. Uh, that, that's uh, no hidden power, it's power right there. And uh, they have enormous influence over the political system. Uh, that's why they get bailed out, but homeowners don't, you know, and even though the legislation called for both. And uh, the same is true of other major sec sectors of concentrated wealth and power. But the public, what the public sees is they don't care about me, so there's got to be some hidden force. I mean, I think by now, probably maybe 90% of the public thinks Congress should just be thrown out because they don't do anything for us anyway. And that, and they're basically right. You know? <laughs> but that's disenfranchising. Yes. And uh, the reasons for that are not all that obscure. And that's the kind of thing that we should be concerned about, not uh, that did George Bush secretly plan to blow up Building 7? So. Which may or may not be true, but... Well, no. That the, is true. You haven't discovered anything about it. Yeah. And in fact, the chances that... I mean, by now, there's a huge number of people who've become uh, skilled physicists after an hour on the internet and can tell you all kind of details about true. how the building collapsed. That's, that's correct. Yeah. Now, I have another question on uh, to jump on U.S. foreign policy, especially in the Middle East. Um, it seems that every time the United States over the last how many years, I don't know, but long time, every time there is an intervention or um, occupation, it leads to disaster. It leads to... Um, depends. Depends for Disaster for whom? Disaster for whom? Well, like take, say, the, what we mentioned before, the coup in Iran in 1953. I mean, that meant that for uh, 25 years, the United States uh, had basically what it wanted in an important country. Oh, yes. That was maybe a disaster for the Iranians, but yes. not for the United States. So likewise, today, it's a disaster for the Iraqis for the last 10 years or more. Yeah. But it's more than that. I mean, the uh, sanctions in the 1990s yes. practically destroyed the country. I mean, it's another thing people don't talk about, but the the, the sanctions were admit they were technically under the UN, and there were respected international diplomats who administered them. Uh, uh, both of them uh, uh, re resigned in protest uh, in claiming that the uh, sanctions were genocidal, literally. Uh, Hans von Sponek, the second one, yes. a very distinguished figure, wrote a long, detailed book about the genocidal effect of the sanctions. It's called A Different Kind of War. And just to tell you about the media, I don't think there was a single review of it in the United States. I checked in England, and I think the only review may have been in the Morning Star, the Communist Party newspaper. I mean, we don't want to hear of it. It's U.S.-British sanctions, which were having, a, they claim, Dennis, the other Dennis Halliday said the same thing. Uh, it's not the kind of story you want to tell the population, so uh, yeah. nobody, nobody hears about it. And it's the same in Syria, same in Libya. Yeah. Now, yeah. Yeah. the United States does not intervene in Zimbabwe, does not intervene in I don't know, Sri Lanka, and it seems that there is a link between this intervention and control of natural resources, especially oil. And as um, conventional oil is uh, decreasing, uh, in, uh, in quantity of ex extracted quantity. We see an increase over the last 20 years of intervention in those countries. Do you think there's a connection between um, 
let's say, this imperialistic foreign policy and the dwindling natural resources? There is, but I don't think it's just the last 10 or 20 years. You go back to uh, the 1940s, and we go back farther. In fact, you go back to the discovery of oil as a fuel, you know, not just something to light lamps with. Uh, as soon as that happened, at that time, mostly the British, secondarily the French, the major imperial powers, at once tried to gain control of the world's major oil resources. The United States didn't have to at the time. It had huge resources of its own. But by the 1920s, uh, the United States had forced Britain out of Venezuela, a major oil producer, had uh, forced its way into the Middle East Agreement, the Red Line Agreement. Uh, 1930s, oil was discovered in Saudi Arabia. It was realized that's huge. The United States kicked the British out, you know, just more force, and essentially took it over. During the Second World War, there was kind of a mini war going on between Britain and the United States, which of course the United States won, not just in Saudi Arabia, but elsewhere. Uh, by 1945, uh, the State Department uh, specialists were calling, uh, describing the Middle East as uh, 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 a, a, one of the greatest uh, material prizes in world history, stupendous source of strategic power. Uh, Eisenhower called it the most strategically important area in the world, but just because of oil. And it wasn't that the United States wanted the oil. In fact, the U.S. was an exporter. It wanted to control the oil. Yeah. It's not access, it's control. Uh, if today the United States was 100% solar, it would still want to control the oil fields. That's the way you control Europe. That's the way you control Japan. I have an enormous, you have your hand on that lever you have an enormous impact on world affairs. That was recognized by George Cannon. It's control of oil give us veto power over Japan. We may not want it, but they need it. And if we control it, we have veto power. When the U.S. invaded Iraq, Brzezinski uh, wasn't in favor of the invasion. He was kind of critical of it. But he said, it will have the advantage of giving us critical leverage over Europe, and that's important because we got to control of Europe. They have always been regarded as a potential enemy. They might move, become independent. Uh, and and uh, so, so, yes, this will continue even uh, as the U.S. becomes a leading exporter again. They will, which it is now already, they'll uh, still want to control the energy resources. Uh, however, the control over resources are very complex issue if you look at it. Take Eastern Congo, enormous resources, maybe five million people killed in the last couple of years. Yes. Nobody intervenes because what's happening to those resources? They're going into the hands of multinationals uh, who use the militias as their ways of you know, ensuring that uh, you get enough uh, coltane for your cell phone and so on. Uh, Millions of people getting killed, but there's no intervention because the resources are going to the right hands of the multinationals who are the proper owners of them. Yeah, but strong. no intervention, purposely. So no. control is more important than ownership. And control and yes. access. But uh, if you're getting it through murderers, militias, and gangsters, why bother intervening? Yeah, very good point. Now, in my in my books, I mention that the world economy has a fairly good chance to collapse as we continue with the, this, um, first of all, overpopulation, uh, decrease of availability of natural resources, but also the reliance of a financial economy, which is more and more a huge bubble. Do you, do you, do you also see that uh, we are um, on the path to uh, economic collapse, and if so, how do you think that could happen, and what should people do to save themselves? Well, you know, the, the economies of the West have been uh, radically financialized since the 1970s. And if you go back to the 1950s and 60s, uh, banks were banks. You had some excess money, you deposited it, uh, they lent it to somebody else to buy a car. Those were bank transactions. 
And from 1970 on, it's totally different. The banks have become highly speculative, uh, dealing with exotic uh, financial instruments growing enormously in scale. Uh, speculative trading has just skyrocketed. Uh, now, by now, it's kind of a comical incident. Uh, about a year ago, right here, there were uh, two major in, uh, infrastructure projects building huge tunnels. Uh, one of them was to go from New Jersey to New York underneath the Hudson River of enormous value to commuter. It's horrible to travel there if you've been there. That one was canceled. Uh, the other one was to dig a tunnel from somewhere near Manhattan to uh, some place in uh, the Midwest where they have uh, huge storage uh, huge facilities for financial transactions. So if you have a the tunnel and the cables and so on, you can cut a couple of microseconds off uh, trading. That one was built, but not, uh, and that's the economy. It's symbolic to the way the economy works. Uh, so you, you can't take a, I mean, the train from New York to Boston takes maybe 15 minutes less than when I took it 60 years ago. But, but uh, you have, uh, speculative transactions are now measured in microseconds. Uh, because uh, th this doesn't contribute to the economy. In fact, it's harmful to the economy. But uh, that's where power lies. And of course, they have enormous, as I mentioned before, they're subsidized by the public to an extraordinary degree. Uh, they uh, carry out extremely harmful actions. They're encouraged to in undertake systemic risk because they don't have to pay for it. Uh, what happened with uh, if you take a look at the details of the last crisis, it is mind-boggling. Like AIG, the world's biggest insurance company, huge insurance company, uh, they were going to collapse. Uh, the government essentially bought them out. I think they owned most of it, but just sort of gave it back to them. Uh, if they had collapsed, Goldman Sachs probably would have collapsed. They have a huge number of complex transactions with AIG, and uh, after that, the whole system sort of falls apart. Well, they were all bailed out by the public. They were, um, as soon as AIG was bailed out, they immediately uh, paid a, a, a extra bonuses to the chief executives, They're basically criminals. They were being jailed. Most of what they were doing is illegal, but they were bailed out by the public, so then they uh, they take it and give themselves huge bonuses. Well, that did raise a few comments, but uh, this uh, Larry Summers, the, the Obama's chief uh, economic advisor, secretary of treasury under Clinton and so on, he commented on it and he said, yeah, it doesn't look nice, but these are legal contracts and we have to obey contracts. But right at the same moment, the state of Illinois was refusing to pay pensions to public service workers because they said they didn't have enough money. Well, that was not only a legal contract, but these people had actually worked for it, not like AIG executives, and they had paid for it. When working people in a union get a pension, it's because they cut back their salaries to pay for the potential security. But for them, the contract didn't matter. For the AIG executives who had the whole country on the ropes and then where they pulled out, bailed out, yeah, that mattered. We have to honor that. And uh, right now, something's taking place which gives chutzpah a bad name. The former head of AIG is suing the government because the government took away some of their profits by uh, the way it bailed them out. They should have given them more profit. And this is at the Supreme Court. <laughs> I mean, look, the whole thing is surreal when you look at it, and this uh, and the you know the serious economists know it. Martin Wolf was probably the most respected economic correspondent in the English-speaking world, at least. He uh, he described the a pretty conservative guy, incidentally. I think he was a Reaganite and a supporter of neoliberal reforms and so on. But he describes the financial sector as being like. Uh, the larva of a spider wasp that eats out the host of the productive economy from the inside. Well, this is right. They shouldn't tolerate that. They, the financial sector should go back to being what it was you know, before the 70s.
And so at that time, there were no financial crises because it was regulated uh, yeah. since, the, since the 70s. You had a big financial crisis every couple of years, yeah. and the government then bails them out, the public you know, bails them out, gets ready for the next one. But that doesn't have to... I mean, those are decisions. They don't have to be... Uh, the, 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 there's no economic law that says it has to work like that. Uh, but there are other problems that are even bigger, which you've discussed, like the uh, threat to the environment, which is a very serious threat. And we're kind of racing towards a precipice. Uh, you know what it is, and uh, very little is being done about it. In fact, it's... So ExxonMobil, major energy corporation in the world, just announced that they're going to focus entirely on fossil fuel extraction because it's so profitable for a couple of years until the whole house crashes. So anyway, thank you, thank you very much for, for your time. I will uh, 